All right. Thank you, Chris. Praise the Lord. All right, if you'd like to uh, get your Bibles out, we are going to go to the book of Jude, verse 17. Fairly well known scriptures. Jude verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that, uh, that they um, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. There's a chorus uh, that we sing. We didn't sing it tonight. It's called uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And uh, it's a pretty uh, well-known chorus. I think we sang it at uh, one minute to midnight for about the first 20 years uh, that I was in the Lord on New Year's Eve. Um, you all know the words. It's got four lines to it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so great words there. Not scripture, but certainly um, scriptural. Um, as far as the Lord's uh, principles are concerned. Um, and so, you know, in that verse 20 there, where he talks about uh, people being sensual, he goes, but ye, beloved, we've got to be different. But you, you are not to do and not to be involved in those things. You are going to do something different. You're actually going to build yourself up on your most holy faith. That's what I want you um, to do. And so the first line there about turning your eyes upon Jesus. Um, and so if we're doing if we're doing that, then, um, you know, we're going to be turning away from something else. We're going to be turning away from the things of the world. We're going to be turning away from things that may uh, distract us, um, that might uh, lead us in uh, different uh, directions, what have you. And we're going to it's going to be a deliberate action that we're going to turn ourselves um, uh, unto the Lord, unto the things that the Lord would want us uh, to be um, to be involved in. And the Bible often tells us about things that uh, we need to turn away from or to put away from ourselves or whatever it uh, uh, might be. And quite often the thing that we're to turn away from is ourself, our, our old life perhaps, our old thoughts. Um, our current thoughts, if they're not lining up with the Word of God, that sort of thing, that we turn away from the world in general and, and turn our eyes upon, upon Jesus. Um, in Joel chapter 2, it says, And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. It's, it's not your stuff that I want, I want you. Uh, uh, rend your heart. Give me of yourself. I'm not interested in your garments and your and your uh, university degrees and your all that stuff of the world. I want your heart. And having done that, turn unto the Lord your God. It's interesting uh, that I think only a few verses after this, I think 15 verses after this, is where he talks about that in the last days I will pour out my spirit. Not just just a few verses. Uh, later after having said that and so people of course can become so uh, self-absorbed perhaps um, consumed with the busyness uh, that life offers us um, that we uh, easily focus on other stuff uh, there's no doubt about that um, unfortunately for some people to the exclusion of the things of God um, uh, completely and so we find that people are, uh, are proud in nature, um, nature of the beast, I guess. Um, and we're in the midst of 
the me generation. I, I don't think there's ever not been a me generation. I think we've all been the me generation. Uh, perhaps it's a little bit more obvious now than perhaps it was um, before. But we obviously want to turn away from those things um, and turn ourselves uh, unto the Lord. I've mentioned some of these sort of things before, but you think of communication and, and just communication that people have with one another. You would think, given the technology available today, that we would have the greatest connectivity of people towards other people in the history of the world. And yet, we don't. There's actually less communication, less interaction than ever before. Oh, there might be, a, I have a look at this photo or whatever, but as far as real interaction of people is concerned, there's probably less now than there's ever been in history, which is a bit of a, um, a, bit of a paradox, really, considering how connected that we think uh, we are. Uh, this little bit here is a little bit old. It's um, sort of four years old, I think, but um, th there's around 6,000 tweets done every second, uh, which is amazing, really, uh, uh, which is around about 200 billion a year. 200 billion of them. Can you imagine it? Um, around about 20 million texts are sent every minute. That's incredible, isn't it? Uh, 156 million emails sent every minute. I think I'm about 15% of that number. Well, it feels like it anyway. Uh, uh, half a million comments on Facebook per minute. Half a million per minute. Unbelievable. 40,000 Google searches every second. 40,000 every second. And so it seems by those numbers that we are interacting with each other a lot. Um, but are we really? Um, people, I think, uh, are often arguing about who's right and who's wrong. Well, you can always argue about those kinds of things. Uh, you're definitely wrong if you're not in agreement with God. If you're not in agreement with the Word of God, that's when, that's when you're definitely on the wrong, on the wrong side there. Uh, the second line, look full in his wonderful face. Well, um, I guess that sort of means a lot of things um, that we're that we're intent that we're looking with intent um, on the, onto the things of the Lord there um, that we're full on for the things of God that it's not a casual glance a brief look a uh, a dabble uh, I think these days people tend to dabble in the things of God um, and it doesn't really matter perhaps what you do we know that not to be the um, uh, the case. Um, maybe I'll have a brief look at, at, uh, at, at the things of God while I'm doing something else even, perhaps. Um, you think about when the Israelites um, were uh, uh, being, or were told to look upon the, uh, the brass serpent there to be healed. Uh, they were told to look intently and expectantly, uh, one translation says. So it wasn't as if you could sort of say, oh, there's the brass serpent, heal me now. It wasn't like that. You had to have a deliberate turning unto that, uh, unto that um, serpent there and to look with intent, look with uh, an expectation. And that's how we look full on his wonderful face, with, with an expectation of what the Lord um, is able to do. And one way to do that, of course, is to remove the distraction. To look, to be intently involved in something, you can't sort of have twenty other things going on at the same time. You've got to be in. Uh, you've got to be focused on that one uh, thing. And so, our life needs to be motivated uh, first and foremost by the Lord and what His Word says and His principles and, and all of those things that we all know well. Um, we can't see his actual face. Um, you can't sort of, uh, you know, do a drawing or anything uh, of him to see what he looks like. But we can see his qualities. We can see what's important to him. Um, uh, we can see perhaps part of his character and how he might uh, react to different things. Um, perhaps even things that we might want to emulate ourselves, um, which we get to do really through the Spirit, 
uh, the fruit of the Spirit, as we're doing those things, we're emulating the things of the Spirit. We're emulating um, the things of God. We think of his sacrifice. Well, we're not going to be called uh, to do that, of course. Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice once and for all. But we might find ourselves willing to put ourselves out for other people and help other, uh, other people that the love that he's shown towards us, which is incredible, um, that we might, I guess, in some small way, uh, demonstrate uh, to, uh, to, to other people. The third line, the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Uh, they will if we've got, they will if we've got the right things in, uh, uh, in perspective. If we've got our priorities right, then the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Or they won't go away completely. We know we've got to do school and work and all that stuff that we love doing, um, interpreting, all that kind of stuff. We love doing all these things, but, we, but, but they're not our priorities, you know. Um, we realise, and maybe the older you get, you realise this more, that the things of earth, not only are they strangely dim, they're not even that important. You know, I've often said, you know, in 500 years, how much of this is going to matter to any of us? It will not. It will not matter at all. Um, what is important is that he increases and we decrease. That's one thing that's very uh, important. Um, we know why we're here. We should know why we're here. And the natural things of life aren't really why we're here. We're passing through. We're, uh, we're strangers and pilgrims, uh, the Bible says there. Um, but we know the things that are important. Um, you're never going to be on your deathbed and think, oh, I, I could have prayed a bit less, or I could have fellowshiped a bit less. I could have been a little bit less involved. Uh, you'll never think those things. You might think, why did I do that? Why did I do that thing that took me away from the things of God? Why did I do that thing that took me away from fellowship with my brothers and sisters or whatever the thing might be? Um, we might think those kinds of things because we'll realise, hopefully not too late, that they're not, they're not important um, uh, at all. One thing we never want to be in the Lord is a is a seat warmer somebody that's just there uh, occupying a seat and not doing anything else it's it doesn't work um, at all the last line in the light of his glory and grace i think we'll realize that the things that we have to deal with that i don't want to minimize what anybody's going through by any means um, may be very serious of course but they're going to pale into insignificance when we compare what we're promised. Um, Jesus' glory, Jesus' grace in our life. They'll pale into insignificance um, with those things. In Jeremiah 9, one of my favourite verses, it says, Let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things i delight saith the lord if you're going to glory in something wow we've got an understanding of the things of of god that you, you can't you can't price that uh you can't exchange that for anything that's going to be better i'll give that away and get some better thing you won't be able to do that so how do we turn our eyes upon Jesus. Well, you can't do it without the Spirit, because otherwise you're just doing it through natural eyes and natural uh, means and natural um, uh, things that we uh, that, that we do in life. We do it through the Spirit and we do it praying in the Spirit. But ye, beloved, don't you be like that, but you, you be different, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in, in the Holy Ghost there. How can we appreciate the things of God uh, without the Spirit? How can we appreciate the things of God without our prayer uh, in the Spirit? The, the Bible says that um, really the things of God are foolishness unto natural man. He, he cannot discern them. They are foolishness 
uh, unto him. Um, um, let's see. Um, that verse 19 there talks about people separating themselves and, and being worldly, sensual, as it says there, having not the, not the spirit. Um, so many have even been blessed in this world, uh, even without the spirit, you know. I've known people that have been healed. Um, but they forget to turn their eyes upon Jesus. Having been blessed, oh, what's that over there? And off we go and do something, uh, do something else. We're called to stir up the gift. Paul told Timothy that, didn't he? Stir up the gift that is in you. Um, building up ourselves, praying in the Holy Ghost. It's our only, it's our only hope. It's the only thing we have hope in. Um, Sage recently talked about hope. I think it was the uh, Youngies Camp theme, I think. Um, anyway, um, how do we keep ourselves in this love of God? How do we keep ourselves um, in that? How do we turn unto Jesus? How do we understand and appreciate what he did and what he will, uh, and what he will do? How do we do any of that without, without the Spirit, without using the Spirit? Um, let's see. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. <clears throat> finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. In order to do verse 10, which is to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, in order to do that, you've got to do verse 11, which is putting on the armour. How much of it do I put on? I put on the whole armour. I put all of it on. <clears throat> when the medieval knights went out, you didn't really see them going, oh, I think I'll wear the helmet, but I'm not going to wear the breastplate, or I'll wear the breastplate, but I'll leave the helmet off, or I won't have my gauntlets on, or whatever it was. They wore the whole thing. They wanted to be, they wanted to be um, uh, protected. And if we're going to rise above the mundane things of life, it's going to be by the Spirit and our commitment to it, um, and, and to be 100% committed uh, to it. Um, and so that's what it says we need the whole armour how will we look full in his wonderful face if we're only going to put bits and pieces of this armour on most Americans say that they believe in God um, of course what they mean is that they believe that a God probably exists that's really what they mean when they when they say that they're not talking about his his principles is not really a commitment behind those words. There's no turning their eyes unto him, uh, typically speaking. Um, there's no looking other really than this cursory glance. Let's just dip my toe in the water and oh, that seems cold. I think I don't like. I think I don't like that. It's a bit like saying uh, Napoleon, who was a you know French emperor. Do you believe in Napoleon? Well, yes. There's pretty good evidence. Irrefutable, I would say, that Napoleon existed. Do I believe in Napoleon? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Have we ever met him? No. I'm not that old. Mm -hmm. Do I know what motivated him? Not really. Do I know his character? No. Uh, I'm not that interested, uh, perhaps, in him. 
And that's how the world approaches God, just like that. Do you believe in God? Um, yes. Have you ever met him? No. Do you know his motivation? No. Do you understand his character? No. Have you ever read about him? No. Do you know what he requires? No. How can we turn our eyes to him when we've just got no, um, uh, no reason to want to get to know him in our own strength when we know nothing about him? It's interesting when you look at the armour here, there's all these bits of armour. Uh, loins girt with truth and breastplate of righteousness and feet and shield of faith and so there's six things that are actual bits of armor there when you list them out but really there's seven there's really seven when you look at these bits of armor and the seventh one is verse 18 praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication um, to all saints. Seven, the number seven in the Bible. God's seal, spiritual perfection. Perhaps without that one, the other six um, are less effective. The other six um, maybe aren't going to be much use to you. So without the spirit, um, what shield of faith will you have? Without the spirit, uh, what helmet of salvation would you have? You've really got to have that seventh one to make the other six uh, effective and working, uh, working in your life. Lots of people can quote scripture. Lots of people can. Lots of people can just turn to any old verse that they wanted. Maybe they've even memorized the whole thing. Um, but without this spirit, it's, it's a head knowledge. Maybe you're very clever, but it doesn't do any good because there's no faith behind it. Um, there's no truth on it. There's no breastplate of righteousness with it. It's just words in a book, like any other book perhaps. But with the eyes of the spirit, um, these things become very real and very effectual. Um, uh, in our life, you know. Um, Bible says to redeem the time. Buy it back. Why? Because the days are evil and they're getting more evil. Uh, in the 80s, we never thought they could possibly get more evil than that. But looking back, it does seem fairly tame <laughs> in comparison uh, now when you sort of look back. Um, the things of the world, they isolate us. Um, certainly from the Lord, rather than connect us. They rob us of time that we could be better spending with, uh, with other things, you know. I think a lot of the times the technology that uh, when I started work in 82, when they were saying, oh, you're going to have so much leisure time, you'll hardly have to work at all. Uh, that has not come true. Um, not even a little bit. Paper is going to be completely done away with. You'll never, ever have to use paper ever again. That's what they told us. I think we use more paper now than we ever, ever did. Um, they probably didn't think we'd have printers. I guess that's why they said that. Um, and so all the technology that we have rob us or can rob us of so much time that we could spend in better ways. In Romans it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Another translation says to be faithful, constant, devoted and maintaining the habit of prayer, maintaining the habit of prayer. God doesn't require these things of us for no reason. He doesn't he doesn't put them in there because he thinks, oh, well, that'll give them something to do. He does it because they're beneficial to us. They're beneficial to our walk with him, our relationship with him, um, our, walk with our, uh, our walk with our brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord. Um, and I'm going to go, well, I won't go away over time. I have to cut something out here. Um, let me see. Um, 
maybe I'll just go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and I might finish there. I always seem to have more scriptures than I can read out. I don't know why. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Prayer is like breathing. You better keep doing it or you're going to die. We've all liked breathing. All of us like doing it. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time now and uh, I like doing it because we know that if we stop doing it, uh, it won't end well for us. Well, prayer is even more important than breathing. We can't stop doing it. Um, so we can't see the Lord, but yes, we can turn our eyes upon him. And it's important that we do. Um, that we embrace the fundamental things that we know about our, uh, about our Lord and Saviour. We've got a vision and we've been illuminated about what life is really all about. Looking full in his wonderful face things that are not seen we talks about here they become strangely dim the, sorry the things that are seen become strangely dim but the things that we can't see they're the things that are actually meant to be bright and shiny the things that we can't see they're eternal they won't fade they won't degrade in a million years, they'll still be there. Nothing of this will be, but the things of God and the things of the Spirit will be. Martha turned her eyes to coffee and donuts and cakes and different things and whatever she was doing uh, out there. I'm out in the kitchen. I've got this really important thing to do. I've got to get the kettle on. I've got to get these cookies baked. Meanwhile, Jesus Christ is in the living room. Where do you think you really should be? Uh, the cookies can wait. Jesus is in the living room. That's where I want to be. Uh, what had Mary done? She turned her eyes upon Jesus. Martha had turned her eyes upon coffee and donuts. What do you think is more important? In the light of his glory and grace, well, it's all available. The glory of the Lord surrounds us. His grace envelops us every single day. But we're called, hallelujah, to take control of our life. <clears throat> Not by imposing our own will on the Lord, which isn't going to work anyway, but by having that commitment, having that relationship, walking every day with uh, the Lord. The natural man has his way, has his plans, has his ideas. What's that saying? Uh, men make their plans and God laughs. <laughs> so you can make all the plans that, that you want. We've got to be strong in his might. We've got to get the armour. We've got to have it on. And we've got to have it effectual. And it won't be effectual without the seventh bit of armour, which is us building up our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. If we turn to the world, if we turn to the temporal, well, that's all you got. You got the temporal, and uh, uh, by nature it won't last. But if we turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. We've got eternal things waiting for us. He is eternal. The Spirit is eternal. If we've got that spirit and we're using it, so will we be when the Lord comes back. All the people said, Amen.